What is up everybody? Welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, welcome. My name is Victoria. I am a woman of trans experience and I make LGBT content here on YouTube. If that's your thing, click that subscribe button down below. Today, I am making an in-depth video about my sexual reassignment surgery or SRS or GRS or vaginoplasty or whatever you want to call it, how I went from having a penis to a vagina. Before I start this video, I want to say not every trans person wants bottom surgery. Not every trans person needs bottom surgery and surgery just make you more or less of a woman. For me, my dysphoria around my genitals were so severe that this surgery wasn't an option for me. It was a medical necessity. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with my story, my name is Victoria. I am a 22 year old woman of transgender experience. I transitioned to age 14. And at the age of 20, I had my sexual reassignment surgery. For me, I have known since I was a little kid that I was meant to be a girl. And since I was a little kid, I was so uncomfortable with what was between my legs. My entire life, I knew that I was meant to be female. From day one, I always used to tie t-shirts over my head and pretend it was long hair. I was obsessed with mermaids and princesses and things like that. Um, so it was never a question for me as to whether or not I was a girl. It was always, why the question was why am I not a girl physically so at age 14 I came out to my family and I transitioned from male to female and this comes with things like social changes hormonal changes and surgical changes not every trans woman wants or needs surgery but for me I would have not felt complete until I the inside matched the outside from head to toe so before we dive right into the story, I want to let you all know how this procedure works. We all start out as female in the womb, which is why males have nipples. And depending on the amount of testosterone that permeates the embryo or the presence of a Y chromosome, the labias fuse to become a scrotum, the clitoris grows out to become a penis, and the ovaries become gonads that will eventually drop and become testes. Because of this, reversing the genitalia back to a female form isn't all that far-fetched or all that difficult. I had a one-step inversion vaginoplasty with Dr. Christine McGinn in New Hope, Pennsylvania in April of 2019. This basically consists of taking the penis and inverting it and rearranging all the nerves and draping the skin to make it look as natural as possible. And I'll get into the natural appearance later, but let me tell you, she's a pussy witch, girl. Like, she does such a good job. So the first step to getting surgery is choosing the right surgeon. So there's all sorts of different methods. There's different ways of doing it. I personally had the penile inversion method. But there's also methods where they take a strip from the colon. There's ones where they take the scrotum and puncture to create sort of a mesh and use that as vaginal lining. There's one of like a stomach lining that they use. There's a lot of different ways out there. Each method has pros and cons. So I definitely recommend that you research that in depth before you go in and before you make your choice on your surgeon. I spent hours and hours scouring the internet trying to find everything that I could, trying to read everybody's account of their surgery. And you might be doing the exact same, which is why you clicked on this video. And I landed on Dr. Christine McGinn in New Hope, Pennsylvania. I chose Dr. McGinn because she herself is also a transgender woman and all of her reviews have been outstanding. I went on her website to look at her results and they looked so natural and great. I was so ready. And I'll say, I don't know how old those photos are, but I look so much better than those looked like even better than I expected. So I called Dr. McGinn's practice, which is called the Papillon Center, and I gave them all my paperwork. I had to submit the letters of approval from different therapists and doctors. And it's a really long process. If you're interested, I might make a whole other video about what you need in order to transition like legally, but that's an entire separate video. So I gave them all of my paperwork, all of the psych evals and everything. And I had a consultation scheduled for February 19th. So when February rolled around, my mom and I drove up to Pennsylvania and we stayed there for a night. We explored the town. It's a really great area. New Hope, Pennsylvania is so pretty. And the next day was my consultation. When I went there, I was so nervous. I was excited, but I was also so nervy. I was like, I'm gonna, what if I, I don't know. So I was sitting in our waiting room and actually during this time, the Papillon Center had just been moved to a different place in the same complex. So they were still getting things all settled in. They didn't have enough chairs and some people were standing and Dr. McGinn walks out. I had, now I had seen Dr. McGinn on Oprah, on all these different shows and interviews. So she's already been kind of a hero and her idol of mine. And she comes walking out and she has these chairs in her arms. She's like, does anyone need a seat? I almost passed out. I was like, do you guys see that? 
do you see her? Is that McGinn? Is no one else freaking out? So I finally get called and I go into the back room and it's basically a physical evaluation. They ask you some questions. They look at your body. They take some before pictures. And then Dr. McGinn came in and her big blue ice eyes were just staring right at me. And her, her long blonde hair, she was just so beautiful. And she was staring right at me and I could not speak. It felt like I was talking to like Oprah. It felt like I was talking to Jesus Christ herself. I was like, uh, hello. And she was so sweet. She's so kind. She's very, you know, she's not that scary, but it's just because she's so beautiful and she's so talented and intelligent that it's just intimidating. So the consultation in the middle of February went super well. And then I went over to the front desk to schedule my appointment and she goes, okay, how about April 23rd? April 23rd. That's February, March, April. That's two months, guys. That was two months away. I have been told that it would be like six months to two years for a wait list. And some surgeons definitely do have a longer wait list. I actually don't know what, how she got me in so soon. Uh, I don't know if it was a cancellation or what, but it was two months away. I was so excited, but I was also nervy. I was so nervous because like it was two months. I've always been ready for it. I wouldn't have gone to this consultation if I wasn't super ready. But knowing that it was two months away, I was like, I have to get all this done. I had to get laser, I had to get electrolysis. I had to do all of these things. It was just a rush. Um, so I got everything together and eventually it worked out. Now during this time, we had to call my insurance so many times. I'm on Blue Cross Blue Shield and it was just a complete battle to get them to pay for anything. They told us initially that it would be paid for, and then we, we paid for it out of pocket, and it wasn't paid for, blah, blah, blah. It was a really long story. I would recommend you call somebody from your health center to help you with that, because it is a long and tedious journey. It took about a year and a half for us to get any reimbursement at all. So in the weeks leading up to surgery, I was so nervous and I was so excited. Just knowing that I had a surgery date in mind was enough to just ease my dysphoria. Whenever I was walking around and I felt my tug slip or something, I would just tell myself, April 23rd, April 23rd, April 23rd. Having a date was just so nice to know that like, I'm not gonna have to deal with this anymore. So two weeks before surgery, I actually had to get off hormones. So I had to stop my testosterone blockers and I got off of estrogen. Now this, <laughs> this got me a little bitchy, I'm not gonna lie. Um, if you ask my mom, she would probably say a little bitchy. Mm, I was getting road rage, like I was just getting more aggressive um, because I was getting testosterone back in my system. But the reason why they take you off is because it actually thins out your blood to be on those medications. So when you're getting surgery, you're more likely to have any kind of excess bleeding or complication. So as if I wasn't bitchy enough for being off my hormones, you have to be on an all liquid diet for 48 hours before surgery. My last meal was like a BLT with fries and I was so, I was just cherishing every moment, you guys, of that BLT. Oh, I love food so much. <sighs> so I was on a 40 hour liquid diet and the last 24 hours of that is an all clear liquid diet. So it started off with like, you know, like animals maybe, or like an insure or something. And then it went to just chicken broth and apple juice. And by the end of it, you guys, I had to drink this like laxative solution to make sure that you were completely cleared out. I had to do enemas. It was so much. You're definitely gonna have to do that. And it's important that you do because you definitely don't want any waste in your system when you're getting this surgery. But it just, I had never felt so empty, you guys. My stomach looked real flat though, it looked real fish. So finally, it's the day of surgery. I was so excited. I was so malnourished. I was so <laughs> ready to just go in and get surgery because I was told that I could eat afterwards. So I was like, let's go. I remember getting to the hospital, being in the waiting room for a while and I got wheeled in. I had some sort of drug in my IV, I guess, when I was being wheeled in for surgery. So I blacked out on the way in. And then I woke up immediately afterwards and all I could think of was, oh my God, I feel like I have to go number two. It felt, I had this pressure inside of me. It felt as if you were so constipated, like it was painful. And so the first thing I said to my nurse was like, oh my God, I have to go, I have to go number two. And she's like, no, you don't, honey. It's just the packing. And apparently what they do is they get some gauze, it's all wound up and they put it inside of your vagina after surgery for a couple days because you don't want it to close up and you can't dilate since it's a fresh wound. So I had this packing sewn into my skin, which that alone was pretty uncomfortable, but it was just so, un I was like so convinced that I had to poop. <laughs> I was so excited to eat afterwards, you guys. I had need for two days. I was literally like shaking. I was so ready to eat. 
and I go to the hospital room and I ask them when I can eat again. And they told me that I was not able to eat yet, that I was still on an all liquid diet and I had to ease me back into having solids so that I wouldn't have to make a bowel movement at all during the time that I was there. Um, that, <laughs> I couldn't even tell you. I was so happy and relieved to have my vagina, but in the same breath, I was so frustrated and disappointed that I couldn't eat something. I was starving. So they brought me to my hospital room and it was so gorgeous. It, I was the only one there. It was just me and my mom and the nurses were great and amazing staff. First day, I don't really remember. I was on liquid morphine like a lot of the time. And then when I got off of that, they put me on like a liquid Tylenol, which was better. So I was still a little loopy. So let's talk about the stories. So when I was on morphine, I did stuff that I don't remember, and especially in my sleep. So I apparently was mumbling to my mom something about there being a chicken somewhere and I had to go get the chicken. I don't remember that. Apparently I would be sleeping and I would wake up and put my knee up and I would, I would pretend to spray it with a spray bottle and like wipe it, whatever. My mom would be like, what are you doing? And I would be like, yeah, go to bed, mom. And apparently, this is the worst part, I was like scratching my arm this whole time because I had this weird thing right over here in my arm. Some of you already know where I'm getting. And I was scratching here and I noticed that it was my IV. And I don't remember doing this, but I guess I ripped my IV out. My mom was like, what are you doing? Stop pulling your IV. She saw that I pulled it out and she was freaking out. So me in my half asleep morphine out drip, I decided I'm just gonna try and shove it back in. And I was trying to put the IV back in my arm, my mom almost passed out. So she's like, hello. Like, and I was like, do you want me to call a nurse? Ugh. She goes, yeah, call a nurse. So I was probably just such a bitch to deal with. I just was in pain and I don't remember doing this at all, but according to her, this happened. <laughs> so I also didn't get a lot of sleep while I was in the hospital because they had to come in every one or three hours, I believe and check on my vitals, which is great and they're supposed to. So, you know, good on them, thank you so much. But they would wake you up like once every couple hours, just to check your vitals. And I was so tired. My poor mom slept in a chair the whole time. Ugh, God bless her. So the first day you're completely bedridden in the hospital. And the second day they try to make you walk around with a walker just because they wanna make sure that you don't get any blood clots or any muscle atrophy. So after a couple days, it was time for me to leave the hospital and go to the recovery home. And I left the hospital with a catheter in and all of my packing and bandages still there. They took the actual catheter bag out. So if I wanted to pee, I would have to go and actually just like flip a nozzle to make it turn on. So I'd be able to pee and then flip it back closed. It was really bizarre. Um, don't recommend it. <laughs> so from the hospital, I went to the Gaia house. Now the Gaia house is a recovery home that's owned and operated by Dr. McGinn herself. She doesn't demand that you go there. You can go to an Airbnb, you can go to a hospital, but the people that run it are two lovely men who are so kind, they're very understanding. It's almost exclusively her patients that stay there and she gives them an exclusive deal. So if you look online, it's super expensive, but if you talk to her, she'll give you a good deal. So yeah, there were little butterflies and cases on each door. The house and the outside of the house were absolutely gorgeous. It was right in front of a lake. It was so beautiful. The people that run it make you a breakfast in bed every day. And they were delicious breakfasts, you guys. It was so nice. The guys that operated are such sweethearts. Overall, my stay in the Gaia house was fantastic. I didn't have all that much pain. Everyone there was super nice. And my mom was my primary caretaker, which I am so grateful for. If you're watching this, thank you so much, mom. <laughs> there was, however, one night. I think it was my first or second night there. And I was still so just amped up and emotional. Even the pain pills also make you kind of emotional, but it was, you know, it's a life-changing surgery. And I was kind of nervous, I guess, because my only experiences with my new vagina were pain. I couldn't even see it yet. So I was so nervous and I was just so afraid that I would be botched. I was so afraid just anything could have possibly gone wrong. And I was freaking out. And my mom actually woke up because I was sobbing and she had to take care of me, which was so nice. My sweet angel mother, God, just incredible. On about day three, I believe, staying at the Gaia house, it was time for me to go and get my packing and my bandages removed. So I went to the Papillon Center with my mom and they were super nice. Shout out to Crystal and Bianna. Hey girl. They were super nice and they actually took out all of my sutures and all of the packing. Now, first, she took out the catheter. 
when you get a catheter removed, it feels, and she told me that it's gonna feel like you're gonna wanna pee all over me because she's taking something out of your urethra and that's the only time you ever feel that. She told me to relax and not to clench up or anything and I probably wouldn't even feel it, but I was so nervous that I was kind of clenching the whole time and she pulled it out and it felt like I was gonna pee everywhere. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. But it felt like I was gonna literally just squirt. But when she removed the packing, you guys, the packing was crazy and nasty. So what she did was she just took it. Like I said, it's wound up gauze that's inside of your vagina to keep it from closing. Cause it's kind of like an ear piercing where you want to keep something in it for a while so that it doesn't close and eventually it'll stay open. And she takes out the gauze just by pulling it. And like a magician pulling scarves out of a hat, you guys, it was eight feet. It was eight feet of packing. She told me it was eight feet. I almost passed out actually, cause it just felt weird. Cause I felt something unraveling inside of me and it was nasty. I'm not gonna get that into it actually. Cause it was just really nasty. But right after that, she taught me how to dilate and she measured my depth. I believe I have five and a half or six inches of depth. I'm super thankful and happy that I have the depth that I do. I know a lot of trans women have between like four and five inches of depth. I know it's a lot deeper with different methods and stuff, but that's why I was so thankful that the penile inversion method, the one step was enough for me. I'm not gonna lie, dilating at first is pretty uncomfortable, especially because it's a open wound. So you're very nervous while you're doing it. So it's gonna be a lot on your mind, but I promise over time it gets easier, it gets more comfortable and you just kind of don't think about it. My last night in the guy house, we were able to get up and walk around. And on the last day of your stay, the pamphlet that I was given said that we were able to go out for dinner finally. We were able to get up and be out of the house for an hour or so at a time, which for us was crazy and kind of intimidating because we were all still in a lot of pain and still just uncomfortable and nervous. So instead of doing that, we decided to all order out and then have it in the common area downstairs. And that was where I got to meet Kim and Jamie and their family. It was so nice to meet them. Hi, Kim and Jamie, if you're watching. If you are going to get surgery with Dr. McGinn or with a doctor that has a recovery home, like an outpatient recovery home, I would highly recommend you stay there. Not only because the staff is gonna be well-versed, they're no, by no means nurses, but they understand what's going on with you. But you're also gonna be with people that are going through the exact same changes as you are. We, all, we maintained contact and after we went back home, we were always texting each other being like, so how do you feel? Here's how I feel, you know, comparing experiences. And that was so great. I'm so thankful that I had those girls to stay by my side to like go step by step with, you know? So when I got back home, I was so much more comfortable. I was in my own bed. It was a long car ride home, I'm not gonna lie. That was five hours in a car on a little donut pillow, but I made it home somehow and I was so happy. I lived in the basement of my parents at the time, so I walked downstairs and I had my whole room to myself. I took like six weeks off work, I think. I would recommend, you know, getting as much time as you possibly can off work, but whatever your surgeon recommends, I would go for. For me, six weeks was great because at first, I had to dilate four times a day for 30 minutes each, plus, you know, set up and clean up. So say 45 minutes, give or take. Every time, four times a day, that's when you wake up, that's after breakfast, before lunch, after lunch, before dinner, and then before bed. That's so many times. So it does take over your whole life for a month or two. I would say about three months is when you're kind of like good and you're back to your normal life. But for quite a while, it's your whole day just dilating and recovering. Every surgeon's gonna have a different way for you to dilate. Some surgeons say to do it three times a day, some say to do it five times a day, some say to do different sizes, some say to stick to one. It's gonna be different. It's gonna be different for every patient and every surgeon. So take what you hear from me or from any other YouTuber with a grain of salt. Before I dive into the pain of the recovery, I wanna talk about the mental aspect. It's no joke, you guys. This surgery is a lot on your mind. Your life totally stops for at least a month while you're recovering from the surgery and after it, your life has completely changed. Although I went back to the same job, I had the same friends, I felt like a different person. It just changed my whole life. And when you're still at home and you haven't been able to like live that new life, you can feel like, oh my God, what did I do to myself? Like, I don't have any friends anymore. I don't get to go out. I just, I'm just bedridden, I have cabin fever. And it's easy to feel, um, scared for sure um, and nervous, but I promise it's worth every second. It's worth every 
moment of doubt is worth every moment of pain. It's worth everything. At first, when you see your vagina, it is incredibly swollen. It's bruised. There's shedding skin. There's, it's just nasty. I remember when I first went to get like the bandages taken off and every past checkup and stuff, they would say, oh my God, you look amazing. And I would be like, I look like Frankenstein, but I promise they know what they're talking about. I look incredible now. And the way that I looked at month one or even month six versus how I look now is totally different. Now on the pain side of things, it's important to know that this surgery is rearranging a lot of really sensitive nerves. So what's going to happen is those nerves are going to be knocked out like a whole power switch for a while. And as things are healing and reconnecting, you're turning those switches back on. And when you do that, it feels like a bolt of electricity is going up that nerve. And there were times when that would happen like once every two minutes for anywhere between like 10 seconds to a minute. Um, so it can be painful. And especially for the first month or two is when I was still getting those shocks a lot. Around month three is when those stopped for the most part. And around month six is when I was less sore and I was able to walk around, dance and do whatever, no problem and live my life pretty much the way that I was before. It took about three weeks for me to get any sensation back besides just pain. I would touch uh, the side of my labia and I'd be able to feel what felt like super raw skin. And it was great. I mean, it felt bad because it felt raw and it was kind of painful, but I could actually feel it for once. It was incredible. So just know you're probably going to be numb for a little while. It does not mean that you're not going to have sensation again. It does not mean that you're a botch. It just means things are going to take some time to get used to it. Healing is nasty, just so you know, and it's probably going to look nasty for at least a month or two. I would say about six months is when you're starting to see the final results. So just be patient. And speaking of results, this is what you all came for. I got surgery about a year and a half ago and I am fully healed, fully everything. And I am here to tell you how I feel now. After spending my entire life knowing that what was between my legs was completely wrong, I was finally able to look down and look in the mirror, see myself naked and see the person that I always knew I was. I chose Dr. McGinn because of her results. I looked on her website and I saw a lot of great natural looking vaginas. And not only that, but people from other doctors, such as Dr. Bowers, who actually trained her and is what known to be the top surgeon in the US, people go to Dr. McGinn to get revisions because Dr. Bowers might have messed them up. So I could not have chose a better surgeon in my opinion. And the photos on her website, like I said, I don't know if they were old, they still looked great, but I look so much better than any of the photos there. And I'm so happy. I really couldn't have done this better at all. Visually, I have all the same parts as any other woman. Um, you know, I have the uh, full vulva, I have the labias, clitoris, urethra, vaginal opening, all of that. It looks totally great and normal. The only thing that might ever indicate to somebody that you have surgery, if you have the penile inversion method like myself, you will likely have two scars that meet at the bottom of your vulva to form a V. And if you're someone that keloids very easily, then you know, be aware of this. Maybe massage your skin with vitamin E oil or something. I don't scar very easily. In fact, I don't know if you saw in the last video, but I had a burn right here that was so bad because I burned it on the oven and it was like black. I was certain that it was going to be there forever and it's not even a week later and it's gone. So I don't really scar very easily. And she also puts it between the labia minora and the labia majora. So they're completely hidden and I am so happy. But even if even if I had giant keloid scars, I would take scarring over having a penis any day. So just go into it knowing that you're probably going to have scars. That's fine. And if someone really loves you, they're not going to care. Functionally, I am completely satisfied with my results. I have no trouble with urination. I know sometimes the urethra can be put wrong and it ends up being a little too high up and girls can pee like out of the toilet or something. Like I never had any issues with that. Everything looks and feels great. I have incredibly comfortable and very enjoyable sex. I will say sex is something that has sort of a learning curve, whether it's masturbation or actual sexual intercourse. You will want to take some time to get to know your body and you should anyway, because it's a whole new part. It's so exciting. Are you kidding? So take some time and get to know yourself, get to know your body before you dive into it with a partner. I am about a year and a half post op. I am totally healed. I am in a committed relationship. And I can tell you that sex for me feels 
incredible, so much better than it ever had before. And I can tell you wholeheartedly that my boyfriend says that it feels absolutely perfectly natural. Even a little supernatural. If you're interested in a more in-depth conversation on sex and sensation, I do have a video that I did a couple weeks ago of an SRS q and I'll put a card up right here so you can click on that and watch it if you're interested. All in all, I wanna let you know this is a serious and life-changing surgery. It is not for the faint of heart, but overall, it was the best decision that I ever made in my entire life. I would do it all again without any anesthesia if I had to. It was worth every moment of pain, every dollar, every tear shed, every moment of uncertainty. It was worth every second of that to have the vagina that I do now. So yeah, that was the story of my sexual reassignment surgery with Dr. McGinn. I never had any complications. I never had to go in for any revision surgeries or anything. It was all great. I truly could not be happier with my life and my body at this moment or with my choice with Dr. McGinn. If you're interested, I will link her page down below. That is the Papillon Center. Highly, highly recommend. She also gives, I believe, free surgery to veterans. So I would check that out. So yeah, that is all from you guys. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up. You know it helps out my channel so much. Share with whoever you need to see it. Subscribe down below. If you're not already, click that bell so you're notified whenever I make a new video every Wednesday. I will link all of my social media in the description box down below so you can follow me there. I will also link my Amazon merch, Redbubble, and Teespring so that you can go and see all of the LGBT pride merch that I've designed just for you, baby. Go check it out. Again, thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you all next Wednesday. I love you. Stay safe out there.